Last lecture, I presented several common types of observational studies used in public health. The purpose of this lecture is to describe several common types of experimental studies. As with the material last time, the material for this lecture was developed by Ann Beardley and Laura Lay at the University of Minnesota's Department of Biostatistics. I am presenting this lecture with their permission. Experimental studies, in contrast to observational studies, involve the investigator controlling some intervention, such as a treatment for the study participants. Examples of interventions of interest in medical or public health research include a new drug, a new surgical procedure, an education or counseling program, or an exercise program. The study participants are followed over time in order to determine the effect of the treatment on the disease or condition of interest. Experimental studies can involve one or more comparison, or control, groups, or no control groups, which would be called an uncontrolled study. They also may involve random assignment, which is known as randomization, of participants to treatments. Don't get randomization confused with random sampling. Experimental studies include laboratory studies, preclinical or animal studies, and clinical trials. We will focus here on clinical trials. As previously mentioned, experimental studies can be designed with or without a comparison group. A controlled trial involves an internal comparison or control group. The control group consists of participants who do not receive the intervention or treatment of interest. Instead, they may, re may receive no treatment at all, a placebo, the, cl the current standard of care treatment, if there is one, or even the same treatment, but delayed until a later time. The presence of a control group that is similar in every other way to the treatment group, except that it did not receive the treatment, allows the investigators to attribute any group differences in outcomes or responses to the treatment itself. An uncontrolled trial does not involve an internal comparison group. It is still considered an experimental study, though, because the investigator directly administers some intervention or treatment to the study participants. This method of investigation has some similarities with both case control and cohort studies. However, unlike in case control studies, there is, no, there is follow up of participants over a period of time until the outcome is observed or the study ends. And unlike in a cohort study, the intervention is planned and administered to participants rather than just observed. Sometimes in the early stages of understanding a new intervention, an uncontrolled design may be used. The gold standard for medical and public health research is the randomized controlled clinical trial, also known as RCCT or RCT. For the purposes of this class, we define an RCT as a prospective study where assignment of participants to an intervention group or a control group is random. Other study designs lack either randomization or a comparison group or both. An RCT need not have a placebo group. Frequently, an RCT compares two or more active treatment groups. In some cases, the control group is the current standard of care, which is then compared to one or more experimental treatments. Many people use the term clinical trial loosely when referencing a non-randomized study design. Thus, you cannot assume that a reference to a clinical trial is to a randomized controlled clinical trial. In order to ethically carry out a randomized study, it is necessary to have what is called equipose. Equipose means that the scientific community as a whole is undecided about whether the new intervention works or not. Why does that matter? Because you can't ethically randomize participants to the new treatment if you are certain that it does not work, and you can't ethically randomize to the current standard of care treatment if you are certain that the new one works better. Generally, the study investigators believe that the new treatment is better, or they wouldn't be proposing the study, but there has to be uh, equipose in the scientific community overall. Closely related to this is the need for equipose in the community of potential participants. This affects the ability to enroll participants, patients, into the study. If the majority of people in the community for which you plan to recruit believe that the new intervention works, they might not be willing to be randomly assigned and risk being assigned to the current standard of care, particularly for very serious or terminal conditions 
for which they won't have a second chance. Conversely, if there is widespread belief that the new treatment won't work, participants may also be unwilling to be randomly assigned. Now let's turn back to random sampling and random assignment. So the distinctions between random sampling and random assignment can sometimes be difficult to grasp. Random sampling is a process of selecting study participants randomly from the population of interest. To give a very old fashioned example, random sampling could be done by drawing names out of a hat. Each person has the same chance of being selected for the study. This ensures that the study sample is representative of the population of interest. In randomized control clinical trials, however, Random sampling is seldom used, and convenient sampling is much more common. Participants are typically selected based on predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria, and this selection process does not necessarily involve random sampling. Random assignment, also called randomization, is the process of assigning study participants randomly to treatment or control groups. To give another very old-fashioned example, Random assignment could be done by tossing a coin for either participant and assigning heads to treatment and tails to control. This ensures that the treatment and control groups are balanced and comparable in all characteristics, both known and unknown, so that any differences observed can be correctly attributed to the treatment. Controlled trials are often conducted using some degree of blinding. Blinding is the act of keeping study personnel, participants, investigators, or assessors unaware of the assigned treatment to promote objective assessment of outcomes and therefore reduce bias. In a placebo-controlled trial with blinding, the control participants receive a placebo that is designed to be indistinguishable from the active treatment. Here are the typical categories of blinding. In a single blind study, the study participants do not know whether they are in the treatment or the control group. In a double-blind study, both the study participants and the physicians and investigators slash investigators are unaware of the treatment assignments. In a triple-blind study, the study participants, the investigators, and the Data Safety and Monitoring Board are all unaware of the treatment assignments. Note that this study design usually involves having at least two statisticians, a DSMB statistician, who is blinded and who assists the DSMB in making decisions about continuing the study, and a study statistician who created the randomization plan for the study and thus is not blinded. An example of a randomized controlled clinical trial is the Multiple Risk Factor Intervention trial, often abbreviated MRFIT and pronounced Mr. Fit. In this trial, which began in 1971, 12,866 men with three specific risk factors for coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking were randomly assigned to two groups. The special intervention group received special interventions intended to reduce the levels of the risk factors. For example, smoking cessation counseling, in addition to usual physical care. While the control or usual care group received usual physician care alone. Both groups were, allowed for, were followed for six to eight years. The outcome or endpoint of interest was death from coronary heart disease. The trial results appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1982. The investigators found that the risk, fac that the risk, factors, risk factor levels declined in both groups, but they declined slightly more in the special intervention group. However, mortality due to coronary heart disease, as well as all cause mor mortality, did not differ significantly between the two groups. The primary advantage of randomized controlled clinical trials over observational studies is that RCTs provide the strongest available evidence for a cause and effect relationship between the intervention and the outcome, because the random assignment minimizes or eliminates any possible confounding. The RCT design minimizes confounding from both known and measured factors and from unknown factors since the random assignment ensures that the treatment groups are comparable. Any potential confounding variables, whether measured in the study or not, will be evenly distributed between the groups. It is extremely difficult or impossible to completely control for confounding in an observational study. What is confounding, you say? 
Confounding is when the relationship between the treatment or exposure and the outcome is interfered with or confounded by a third variable. An example would be a fictional study of the relationship between coffee drinking and cancer. The study might observe that coffee drinkers are at higher risk of cancer, but this apparent relationship might really be due to smoking. If coffee drinkers are more likely to smoke, then the smoking could be responsible for the increased cancer risk, not the coffee. Smoking in this example would be a confounding factor. The primary disadvantage of randomized controlled clinical trials is that they are time consuming and expensive. There still is some potential for bias in randomized trials, although the randomization itself removes many potential sources of bias. Procedure bias may occur when the treatment group receives more attention than the control group. Recall bias may occur when subjects in one group are more likely to remember events than subjects in another group. This would only cause bias if the outcome were self-reported. Compliance bias may occur when patients comply with one treatment more than another. When reading the medical or public health literature, pay careful attention to the description of the study design. It should provide enough information to enable the reader to answer, answer these key questions of interest from a statistical perspective. Was the study observational experimental? How were the data collected? For an observational study, what study design was used? What random sampling was random sampling used? If so, how was it implemented? What are some potential sources of bias? For an experimental study, what study design was used? Was the study controlled? Was it blinded? What are the characteristics of the study sample? Was random assignment used? If so, how was it implemented? What are some potential sources of bias?